when I first looked at that passage this week, it sort of reminded me when we used to go camping with the kids, you know, setting up tents and, uh, and then awnings over tents and all that sort of stuff and just how much trouble uh, you'd go to for that sort of thing. But uh, it's an important passage today as we get to the final uh, chapter here in the book of Exodus. Uh, this year, Julie and I uh, put a deposit on a house and land package at Leppington. That's the uh, little design thing of where the house sits on the block and all that sort of stuff. We've decided that uh, when I retire from full, full-time paid ministry, we're, we're not going to have a sea change. We're, we're not going to head to the beautiful coastal areas of New South Wales and we're not going to have a tree change uh, and seek the serenity of co- uh, country living. And we're not going to move closer to family either. My family live on the northwest side of Sydney. Uh, we've, we've actually we've decided we're going to settle in southwest Sydney uh, when I retire. Uh, but that decision to settle, to dwell in southwest Sydney, has meant many hours of walking through display villages. I don't know if you've done that, but it's uh, quite tiring. Uh, checking out all the different builders and then poring over house plans to find something that might be suitable to live in. And then uh, searching for a small, tiny block of land that we could possibly afford. Um, all of that so we could uh, settle in southwest Sydney. It's no small decision, is it, when you decide where you want to settle down. You sort of think about, what are my neighbours going to be like? What's the the area like? What are the services like? All that sort of stuff. Well, um, today we come to that moment of truth for the Israelite people, and that is, will God dwell with his people Israel? Now that the tabernacle has been built, will God dwell with his people? Will they be the sort of neighbours that God would want to hang around with? Or will they be their really irritating neighbours? You know, since leaving the bonds of slavery in Egypt, you know, the Israelites haven't been a shining success, have they? They've grumbled and they've complained against God about their circumstances. They've proven themselves to be thoroughly treacherous when they bowed down and worshipped the golden calf, calf, declaring that not only is this the God that rescued them from slavery in Egypt, but this is now going to be the God that's going to lead us into the promised land. So what do you make of these, these final chapters of this book that was so important for the life of Israel? Well, the first thing we learn here is that finally Israel gets it right. After they've experienced God's mercy, doesn't, God doesn't wipe them out after they would worship the golden calf. He has mercy on them once again and Israel gets it right. Have a look at verse, uh, chapter, verse, chapter 39, verse 32. It says, So all the work on the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was completed. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord uh, commanded Moses. So here in Exodus, it it recounts Israel's obedience by recounting for us the completed work of the tabernacle. And and it lists off for us all the different uh, components that go to make up the tabernacle and also speaks about the garments that the priests are going to wear. And we get this same sort of idea repeated in verses 42 and 43 of chapter 39 as well. It says, the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. So here we see Israel once again ready to deal with God on God's terms, not their terms. They're finally going to do what God required of them in the first place, rather than thinking they could do it their own way. At this moment, Israel have learnt their lesson, that their future with God must involve their faithful obedience. And one of the interesting features about this passage that we've read this morning is the sort of parallels that there are between this account and the creation accounts in Genesis, in the opening chapters of Genesis. For example, in verse 32 of our passage, it says the work is completed and it uses the very same word to describe God's completed work in creation in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. 
Or in verse 43, it says, Moses inspected the work and saw that it was complete and according to God's plan. And, and so in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, we read about how God inspects his creation and sees that it's all good. And in our passage today, verse 43, we hear about Moses blessing the people after the completed work. And again, in, in uh, the creation account, God blesses creation in Genesis chapter 1, verses 22 and 28. And these hints at the creation account are not accidental in this passage. It's as though what we are reading today, here Israel is going to gain what humanity lost at the fall in Genesis chapter 3. That with the creation of this tabernacle, they will now enjoy fellowship with God that was lost at the fall. So that's the first point. Israel finally get it right. That brings us now to the moment of truth for Moses and the Israelites in chapter 40. Uh, Moses is instructed how to put the tabernacle together and just to be arranged in a certain particular way. And then in verse 17 we read, so the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. Okay, so it's been at 12 months since the Israelites were rescued from slavery in Egypt. In fact, their exodus from Egypt actually marked a new beginning for them. They start a whole new calendar from that moment. And now it's the first anniversary since they've left uh, Egypt and the tabernacle is finally built. And just as Moses hangs the final curtain to the entrance to the courtyard, we read there in verses 34 to 35, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Friends, that is the, that is the big finish that is like the final scene in the book of Exodus that we've been looking at uh, last year and this year. This is the moment that God has been working towards. The, visible, uh, the cloud is a visible token of God's presence and God's glory that would guide them now into the promised land. That God, the answer is, will God dwell with these stiff-necked and rebellious people? Yes, he will. And he will lead them into the land promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, when I read that verse, you know, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, I sort of thought, is that, is that all the glory of the Lord is? A big cloud. Like, I don't know if you've been up to Katoomba when the sort of clouds hang low over there. Is that, is that all it was? Um, it, it really doesn't quite do it for me, a low-flying cloud, when I think about the glory of the Lord. But... I actually had a bit of a look at what the glory, how the glory of the Lord is actually spoken of in the book of Exodus um, and, and how it plays out in the life of God's people. I don't know if you know this, but the glory of the Lord does not appear in the book of Genesis. The first time we read about it is in the book of Exodus. And, and actually, God's glory is mentioned at four key moments in the life of Israel. The first is mentioned in Exodus chapter 14 when the Israelites pass through the Red Sea. You remember how they pass through on dry land and then Pharaoh's army charged in after them and the waters closed in over Pharaoh's army and they were swamped by the deluge. That's the first time the glory of the Lord is mentioned. Second time it's mentioned is Exodus, Exodus chapter 16. And that's uh, when God bears with Israel's whinging and complaining in the desert. You know how they were complaining they didn't have enough food, that they were going to starve to death out in the desert? Well, again, we read about the glory of the Lord in the context of Israel complaining about not having enough food and God providing manna from heaven. Third mention is in Exodus chapter 24. And that's where we read about God's glory descends like a consuming fire on Mount Sinai. And it was there that God speaks to his people, Israel. And then the fourth mention of 
uh, God's glory is after the golden calf incident. You might remember how Moses interceded on behalf of Israel, how Moses pled with God not to destroy them. And God, rather than wiping out Israel from the face of the earth, decides that he's going to persist with Israel. And it's there in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. This is what Moses says to God. Moses says, now show me your glory. Okay? That's what Moses asked for. Now show me your glory. Now look how God responds to Moses' request to see his glory. Verses 19 uh, of that chapter. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see, when Moses asks to see God's glory, what does God show him? He shows him his compassion. He doesn't show him his strength. He doesn't show him his power that ushered in creation can bring down nations. God's glory is found in his goodness. His goodness that is demonstrated through his mercy and compassion. That is the glory of God. And that is why God's glory is mentioned in those other parts of Exodus. Because that is where we see God's goodness on view. At the Red Sea, when he graciously rescues his people Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. In the wilderness, where he graciously feeds and cares for these ungrateful and complaining people. At Mount Sinai, where he graciously comes down and speaks to his people. And finally, after the golden calf incident, where Israel has smashed the covenant relationship, God graciously finds it in his heart to forgive their treachery. And the great wonder of these final verses that we have in the book of Exodus is that for this stubborn and stiff-necked people is that the God of the universe who created everything will dwell with them and that God's glory will fill the tabernacle and this will be their only hope for the future because without God's goodness demonstrated in his mercy and compassion, Israel are going to be without a hope in the world. A while ago, I read this uh, great story about uh, Queen Elizabeth. There, there was this young couple by the name of John and Francis, and, and they had booked their civil wedding at the uh, Manchester Town Hall. And uh, they later discovered, uh, they received a phone call actually from the palace saying that they'll be sharing the Town Hall with the Queen that day. She was there celebrating some of the, uh, the celebrations marking her reign over England. So the young couple, you know, they're, they're fans of the royal family. They, they lightheartedly, they sent an invitation to the Queen saying, would you like to attend our wedding? Not really expecting anything uh, from uh, the Queen at all, but they did receive a polite reply from the palace that simply thanked them for their kind invitation and nothing more was said. However, on the day, in fact, after the wedding ceremony had been completed, John and Francis were asked by the town hall staff if they'd mind waiting in the corridor for a few moments. And then they were stunned when the Queen arrived. The Queen had made a deliberate detour from her original schedule to meet this couple. She actually took time out of her schedule to meet this young couple. She addressed them by name and she wished them well for their future. And then Prince Philip and the rest of the other dignitaries that were there with the Queen, they all lined up to congratulate the couple. And it's really a, it's a lovely story, isn't it, of the monarch meeting her people. But I want to say to you that this is nothing compared to what God does for Israel. The Queen takes a few moments out of her schedule to congratulate this couple who are fans of the royal family. But here in our passage, God, who created the whole universe, he chooses to dwell with his whinging, stiff-necked, ungrateful and rebellious people. 
It is a breathtaking act of grace, isn't it? And that is why it is not God's splendour, not his majesty, not his power that fills a temple, but his glory. His glory. Exodus finishes with a very promising scene, doesn't it? Of God dwelling amongst his people, enthroned in their midst. But unfortunately, there's a lot more pages to the books of the Old Testament, isn't there? This is not the end of God's dealings with his people Israel. In fact, later on, the Israelites eventually do settle into the promised land. And rather than using the tabernacle, King Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem. And upon its completion, there's sort of this grand occasion where, that's recorded for us in, act, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8. The priests bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. Then in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 11, we read, When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It's an exact rerun, isn't it, of the passage that we've read here in Exodus today. And King Solomon, he's so in awe of what, uh, what he's seen. He prays before the whole assembly. And in 1 Kings 8.23, he says, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on the earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Here the glory of the Lord fills the temple. And here Solomon wonders at God, the goodness of God, that he would dwell with his people with mercy and compassion. And again, it would be great if the Old Testament just finished there in, Acts, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, but it doesn't. There are plenty more pages that actually describe the difficult relationship that exists between God and his people Israel. You know, God was absolutely right when he described them as a stiff-necked and rebellious people. They persisted in chasing after other gods. They persisted in bowing down to other idols. And the temple with the Ark of the Covenant inside of it, it became this sort of false sense of confidence for them that, you know, God is here and present with us, and so it doesn't matter what we do. Doesn't, our sin, our blatant sin doesn't matter. And so God's mercy and compassion is stretched to breaking point in the Old Testament. And then in a vision by the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel looks at the temple and he sees the glory of the Lord leave the temple and disappear over the horizon. At that moment, God had left the building. His goodness had left his people. His relationship with them was to never be to the same. And in, God's, in, in judgment, God's people are sent into exile and the temple is destroyed. But when their punishment is complete, they return back to the promised land and they rebuild the temple. It wasn't quite as good as the first one, but it was still it was a temple. But the glory of the Lord doesn't return. In fact, never again do we hear about the glory of the Lord filling a tabernacle or a temple in all of the pages of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, it doesn't sort of end with a huge fanfare with, between God and his people. It actually ends with a bit of a groan. God's goodness experienced in his mercy and compassion is not with Israel like it used to be. But it all changed one night. It all changed one night in the town of Bethlehem. And I'd like to take you to one of the most breathtaking verses that we have in the New Testament. It's John chapter 1, verse 14. There it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here in this single verse, the Old Testament threads of tabernacle and God's glory are intertwined, not in a cloud descending on a portable tabernacle or a stationary temple, 
but on the Son of God becoming one of us. You see, friends, this is our moment of truth. In fact, this is one of those moments where our English translations of the, in the, of the text actually doesn't do justice to a more literal translation. A more literal translation would read, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And so as the Son of God becomes one of us, He experiences our fallen and broken world just like we do. We do not have a saviour who is unfamiliar with the life that we live in this world. He actually understood what it was all like. He grew up in impoverished circumstances. He, He was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His family dismissed him as crazy. His friends and followers misunderstood. Uh, misunderstood him and failed him. The crowds always wanted a piece of him. His enemies conspired and betrayed him. Time and time and time again, he meets our brokenness with grace and truth that would eventually lead him to the cross. And there God's goodness is seen in his mercy and compassion as it is poured out for you And for me, for our failure, for our faithlessness. And there the glory of the Lord is seen in all of its brilliance as Jesus bears the punishment our sins deserve and as forgiveness is won for our rebellious indifference. You see, God's glory will never be located in the soaring architecture of the grandest cathedrals that you could visit. His presence and his glory will not be found in majestic scenes in nature like at the Blue Mountains or the Grand Canyon. His presence and his glory will not be felt through awe-inspiring choral music or moving praise and worship songs. The presence and the glory of God has been seen and heard in ancient Palestine where the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And we now see his glory in the pages of scripture. Now that can seem like nothing more than a bit of ancient history for us, isn't it? It's over 2,000 years ago all this happened. It it doesn't seem to have much connection with us today uh, in this building. Uh, But for those who have come to Jesus in repentance and faith, there are a couple of surprises for us in the New Testament. In fact, at the end of the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said to those who would be his disciples, in verse 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now you might be wondering, how on, how on earth is that possible? I mean, given that we're here and Jesus ascended to the right hand of God. How can we possibly know God's presence now? Well, that promise was fulfilled with the gift of the Holy Spirit living in each of us. The Apostle Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. If you're a Christian person here this morning, if you are somebody who follows Christ, here we are reminded that our life and our bodies are not our own to do as we please. As much as the world might tell us we can do what we like with our own bodies, here we're told that Christ's death was the price paid for your life and my life. And that God is present in each of our lives because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. That is where God is doing the work on the inside of us. He's bringing about that change from inside of us to bring about repentance and faith in our lives so that we become more like Jesus. But there's one more surprise that we have in the pages of the New Testament. It's actually for our fellowship when we gather together like this. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, Don't you know that you yourselves are, the, are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? 
If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So here we can see just how precious our fellowship is when we gather together like we do for church. That God is present by his spirit. When we are indifferent to our church gatherings or approach church like a consumer, always asking the question, what's in it for me today? That will damage our common life as a temple in which the spirit dwells. You know, this is a great building. I know it's really hot today. But, you know, I've been ministering here for over 20 years now. And as great as this building is, this building does not usher us into the presence of God. God's presence is not restricted to a building. We don't need to make some sort of journey to some far-off place to, to, to meet God. And nor is God's presence only embodied in his Son now. By the work of God's Spirit and the proclamation of God's Word, God is present wherever Christian people met, meet together for the cause of Christ. That is why Jesus could promise, and Jack mentioned it at the very beginning of our service from Matthew 18, verse 20, for, we were, uh, for where two or three gathered together in my name, there I am with them. If you've been at St Luke's for any length of time, you'll know that we're not very big on church calendars. Uh, the, only thing, the only sort of times that we mark in the church calendar here at St Luke's is Christmas and Easter. But in the lead up to Christmas, there is a, a period of time that marks actually the beginning of the church calendar. And I'm just going to ask, can anyone tell me what, it, what is the period that we are presently in at the moment? Yep, Advent, that's right. We are in the period of Advent. That, uh, and, and Advent, like I said, it marks the beginning of the church calendar. Um, now for some people, Advent is nothing more than the sort of the countdown to Christmas. Okay, uh, you know, waiting for the celebrations to begin. The word Advent actually means coming. Okay, so we're counting down for the coming of Jesus. But there's far more to this Advent season than simply waiting for Christmas. Hopefully, as we've looked at this moment of truth for Israel where the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle... I hope for all of us here this morning that we will treasure what it meant for the word to become flesh and to tabernacle with us and that we would now wait in faith and hope for that final moment of truth, for that final advent, for that final coming when Jesus will return in all of his glory and it will be there for all the world to see. And on that day, he will gather up those who've been marked by the Holy Spirit, those who belong to him from every nation, language, tribe and people. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the way that you dealt graciously uh, with your people Israel, that you... Uh, showed them your goodness by showing them mercy. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ways that uh, the Old Testament points towards your Son, our Saviour, who left the realms of glory and tabernacled with us. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are now present in our lives by your Spirit, not only in our lives as individuals, doing that great work of transforming us to become like your son, but also present with us as we gather together in the cause of Jesus. And so, Heavenly Father, as we approach Christmas in this Advent season, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we might treasure again just how great it is that you sent your son into the world to be with us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.